the person who would interfere with a fairy fort would be out of their mind, to put it simply. Now, there were these two men, not so far from Quinn, in the County Clare. Decent men in their own way. Poor men. They had only a cow each and a small bit of ground. But in the autumn time of the year, they used to go out hunting, hunting. They had only one gun between them. And the reason they'd go out at that time of year, of course, was the obvious reason. There'd be no leaves on the trees and they'd be able to see what they'd be doing. In the line of shooting, that is. Now, just Sean had the gun. Pat used to go with him, uh, just for company. And this particular evening in the month of October, they were out. Lovely, fine evening, grand, frosty bit of weather. And they had travelled, oh, over a whole town land. And they had shot nothing. But they didn't care. It was a grand bit of exercise. And, as I said, a fine bit of weather. Lovely evening entirely. And, as well as that, it was a nice way of talking to the people that they met on the way. Now, in those days, of course, <laughs> people had time for talking. Not like today, where everybody is busy, in a hurry, chasing their tails. And you meet nobody. Not even in a pub today. Hmm. But in any case, they were coming home when darkness was falling. And on the way home, they had to pass this fort. And it's called Corbelli Fort. Big fort above on a hill. And the thing about it is, it's a double ring fort. In fact, it's two forts next to each other. And it's no ordinary fort because there's many and many a story about that fort. In fact, even Biddy Early warned people about that fort, keep away from that fort. Avoid it, if you at all can, because there's something about that fort that, that, um, well, you would be better to avoid it. It isn't like other forts in the vicinity. There's many forts around there, but this one... Hmm. In any case, they were coming back. They had shot nothing. They hadn't shot a goose, a duck, a rabbit or nothing else. And they were there. Your man, he had the gun broken over his shoulder, Sean, uh, and chatting away. But just as they were passing the butt of the hill, where the fort was above... Whatever look he gave up, Sean, he saw above in one of the bushes this big white shape, a goose, a goose, and of course he click, click, loaded up the gun and fired. You don't want to be walking home with nothing, if you can at all help it. He fired, and immediately he saw a feather spreading out and the goose falling down between the branches. Because he said, I got him, I got him. No, Pat looked up. And you say, what are you talking about? I don't see nothing. I yes, you were blind. You were blind, says Sean. And he ran up the hill. And Pat following him. And, and Sean, he, he, there was the, the, the goose. And the feathers spread around it. And he saw the blood, of course, after shooting, after shooting it. Left on the gun. And he reached in under the bush to pull out the goose. And Pat there watching him. As if he was, what in the name of God is wrong with him? Uh, and he pulled mm, at nothing. Because the minute his hand touched the thing inside, there was nothing there except what looked like old frog spawn. And of course he pulled back his hand <coughs> like that. But whatever it was stuck to his hand. <laughs> Not feathers, I assure you. But, like I said, like frog spawn, was already turning black. And he tried, of course, he tried to rub it off, but he couldn't. And Pat said to him, come out of it, will you? Come out of it, why did you fire into the fort? And pulled him away. 
and picked up the gun, of course, and pulled him down the hill. As soon as they got down to the road, they made their way back to their own places. No, they were neighbours, they were neighbours, and they made their way to their own houses. That was fine. But the following morning, Pat, after he had eaten his breakfast, he came out in the doorway, which he'd do every morning to have a smoke, smoke, lit up his pipe, and looked around him. It was a lovely, frosty morning. And normally, Sean would be doing the same over at his house. But this morning there was no sign of Sean. And Pat said, Be God, that's strange. Now, they were bachelors, so Be God, they had their time to themselves. There was no families to be seen to. So he gave a stroll over. And he knocked at Sean's door. No reply. And he knocked again. No reply. And he went to the window and he gave a tap. No reply. So being that he went back and he tried the latch of the door. And the door was locked. Which was unusual because in them days doors weren't always locked. Especially poor people's doors because they had nothing to take. <laughs> so he went around the back and he peeped in. No, there was no curtain in the window, because, be God, I tell you, old bachelors that time, <laughs> it wasn't curtains and decorations they'd be normally worried about. And what did he see? There, inside in the bed, he saw Sean, and every bone in his body seemed to be twisted. His hands, his legs, he saw his face, and holy God, his mouth was twisted. His eyes were twisted back in his head. And of course, no, no, he had to get in to see was he dead or alive. So what he did was, outside, he got a bit of timber and he <coughs> broke the window. A thing he didn't want to do, but he had to get in to see was his friend dead or alive. He broke the window and cut the catch inside and lifted it up. And he, he shouted in, I do life, I do what, what, I do, I do this, I do that. And the man inside in the bed, get, get a doctor, get a doctor, I'm dying, I'm dying. And by the Lord, I tell you, he rose up the window fully and climbed in and opened the door from inside. And, and he looked at the man in the bed and he did did get the doctor. In he went to Tulla, in to Tulla where the doctor was, told the doctor what he was after seeing outside and the doctor came. Now the doctor must be the only person in Tulla that time that had a car or one of the very few and the doctor came with his bag and he hadn't opened the bag at all. He took one look at the man inside in the bed. Hospital for him, said the doctor and they brought him out and put him into the back seat of the doctor's car and brought him to the hospital. Now, the hospital in that time was at Garura. <laughs> it was the workhouse hospital. And they brought him and they explained to the matron, look, a patient for you. And luckily, it was the month of November. If that was December, January, February, the place would be full. Because in them times, well, beggar men and others like that, it's in the workhouses they'd keep up for the winter. But it was still only the end of October, the start of November, when they brought him. And the place was fairly empty. So he was brought in to one of the wards where he was alone. So the doctor said, look, matron, there he is. Do what you can for him. We will, doctor. And the doctor and his friend, they left. But before he left, he said to Sean, Pat did, don't worry, Pat, or don't worry, Sean, I'll look after the cow. You'll be out in a few days. Anyway, Pat went away. The doctor left. 
and he was left to the mercies of the authorities in Garura. Night came, and he was there alone, and there he was in the silence of the place. Now, you know yourself as well as I do that workhouses weren't exactly the most comfortable of places, <laughs> and the moon rose up, and he was there, couldn't sleep, of course, <laughs> crippled, crippled, eh? And the moon was shining in the small little windows, hmm? high up on the walls. <laughs> and it was cold, it was the cold that was keeping him awake, as well as being crippled like he was. But sometime out late in the night, he had this scratching. And of course, the first thought into his mind was, rats, rats. And if it was rats, he was in terrible danger. Because if they came in, they'd eat him, they'd eat him. And they could, they could, because he was alone. And was there staff here? Because he, he could hardly talk, he could hardly talk. <laughs> but it wasn't rats. Because he, he looked, he looked, turned around. And out of the corner of his eye, what did he see below, thudded down the ward, only coming in through the wall, he saw a leg. And another leg. And another leg. And another le Four human legs. Slowly and slowly coming in through the wall and remember now these were stone walls built solidly them workhouses about two and a half feet thick and here now come these legs through the wall <laughs> and he was there looking at him oh, god almighty what's this but there was worse to come because then he saw the hands coming in elbows first and then the end of a coffin and the legs and the elbows and the coffin and the hands and the rest of two people and the rest of the coffin slowly and slowly came into the ward and then two more legs and the end of the coffin and two more elbows and another man and they turned around and they started walking up the ward towards him inside in the bed. And when they arrived at the bedside where he was, they left down the coffin on the floor beside the bed. They looked at him, and one of them said to him, Get out of that bed. You're the man, you're the man that fired into Cardbally Fort today into our house get out of that bed ah, ah, <laughs> and he bent down and he started unscrewing the screws at the four corners of the lid of the coffin and then he pulled it aside and there inside in the coffin was a fourth man and he covered in blood from his head down to his feet and look what you did to our brother when you fired into our house at Carbally. get out of that bed and pick every pellet out of him before the morning dawns before the sun comes up or if you don't you'll be inside in that coffin with him and we'll put on the cover and you can sort out your argument and your problems with our brother when we put on the cover and carry you back. <laughs> Get out of the bed now and start. Out. 
<laughs> and of course, he couldn't move. He was crippled. All he could do was roll out of the bed with a plop onto the floor and reach his hand into the coffin, into the dead man, and start, start rooting around in that same dead man, looking for the pellets that he had fired into the fort, into the goose, uh, and plop, plop, plop. One by one they were building up into a little heap on the floor beside beside the coffin. And the lads outside hurry on, hurry on, and they're looking out the window, hurry on, it's getting earlier, it's getting earlier, and as the sun was almost coming up, almost coming up, there they were, hurry on, hurry on will you, hurry on, it's getting near daybreak, and just as the sun was about to dawn, Somehow or other, he found the lash pellet he, as he was rooting around there in the fellow's neck. Neck. Pure look. Pure look. Hmm? He managed to find the lashed one. Plop. Plop. It landed in the heap of pellets there beside the coffin. <laughs> if you think his troubles were over, wrong. Because just as he found the lashed pellet, the man in the coffin... His two eyes opened, and he began to rise up, up, up on his elbows. And he stared at Sean. Well, 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 are you the man that fired at me? And I doing nothing at all to you? Well, well, well. <laughs> and of course, Sean, but, but how did I know? And to fire into a fork. Well, well, well. <laughs> and of course, Sean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And he dashed in under the bed and he started scraping at the wall to get out, get out, out he. But of course, he might as well be idle and a stone wall, two and a half feet thick. But at that moment, the sun just rose up over the horizon a little bit. It was daylight and the three lads outside, come on, come on, come on, we, we must be going. What they do? Only took the coffin, slammed down the cover of it, up on their shoulders and out through the wall, just like they had come in. Do you think Sean came out from under the bed? Not a hope. He was there, curled up inside and he shivering and shaking and he was there until... The matron came in at half past eight with the doctor. And the doctor looked around and said, uh, Matron, I thought you said you had a patient for me. Well, I thought I had two, says the matron. Now remember, Sean was under the bed, terrified still. And when they came in, the matron and the doctor and a nurse or two, all he saw from under the bed was their legs. And he thought was the, the lad's back again for him. And he let a screech out of him. And out under the doctor's legs and lit out. Out the door and ran for it. Ran, ran out of Tulla. Never stopped until he came to Innes and didn't stop there either. Down the streets of Innes, down to Clare Castle, down to the pier in Clare, Clare Castle. And luckily for him, there was a ship there just about to sail for Limerick. Jumped down into it and put his two arms around the mast. And no matter what the sailors did, they could not pry him loose. Until at last the captain said, I'd leave him there or we'll miss the tide. They left him there. And that's how he got to Limerick. And, you know what? <laughs> Somehow or another, hmm, he got a ship there that was sailing to America. He must have worked his passage or something like that. But he did get to America. And he did all right in America. He married in America. He raised a family in America. But he never came back to Ireland after that. And why? Because he knew very well that if he did, <laughs> they'd be waiting for him. The boys, the boys from Carbally Fort. And if they caught him this time, ah, they'd make no mistake. They'd make no mistake. And that's why so many Irish people went to America in days gone by. 
Oh yes, oh yes, a lot of it was from hunger, a lot of it was from un unemployment and all the rest of it. But a lot of Irish people went to America to escape the fairies. If you said that to people today, <coughs> they'd laugh at you. But I'm telling you, the reason they laugh is because, because there's embarrassment there. And people very often don't like to talk about the truth. And I'll be telling you more stories about that in times to come.